Well, today's episode is brought to you by West End, South Australia's most iconic beer. Now, it's a clean, fresh draft beer. There's nothing more local, nothing more South Australian than cracking a red tin. I say it's the darkest times of my life, but it was the greatest thing that ever could have happened to me. And that sounds do completely you genuinely, stupid. Do you genuinely believe that? Or yeah. Is that, hey, really? I, I, genuinely, because yep. I guess, you know, the first couple of years of my footy career was pretty easy. I mm. had games, I was playing at the top level, life was going pretty well. And I probably did get caught in that little footy bubble where you're not really in reality. You're living this dream and... Mm. Um, Things are happening and you think, I'm going to play for 15 years, going to win a couple of flags. Make a pack of coin. Exactly. And and then suddenly you get injured and everything gets ripped away from you. You're like... This week's guest, Jack Trengove, was only 20 years old when the Melbourne Footy Club made him captain, the youngest skipper in AFL history. Jack was a prodigy as a teenager with Sturt and the Sandful, then took the AFL by storm before he was crippled with a debilitating foot injury. Resilience is the first word that comes to mind when we think of Jack's story. And he's put all of the football troubles behind him to now become a successful businessman. He's a financial whiz and he's preparing to run the New York Marathon alongside his sister, Commonwealth Games gold medalist Jess Trengove. Although he might not be running side by side, he might be just a little behind her. Jack has a fantastic story and I'm really grateful that he shares it with us here. Welcome along to The Soda Room, a place where we get to know the real stories behind some of the biggest names in the game. It was like we had won the grand final. I just got some new boots. It was something yeah. special for me. Did you understand the significance of that moment? Oh, yeah. Nothing compared. That's what I thought I had to do as a leader. You've got the same undies on. <laughs> I've got exactly the same ones on. Jack Trengove, welcome along, mate. Very, very excited to have you here. A good Sturt boy, a good demon. Um, what are you? You've also been a magpie and a power fist. Yeah. What else? Bit of a mixed bag. A That's bit of it. everything. Yeah. <laughs> mate, welcome along. Thanks for having me, mate. Um, so good to have you in here. Now, I'm just trying to work out where we start with you because there's so much that's gone on in your world. I might just start right here now and go, mate, you are preparing to follow in your sister's footsteps and run the New York Marathon in the next, well, couple of months. I am, yes. Potentially irresponsibly. But yeah, I've always, it's always been a bucket list thing for yeah. me to do. And I got approached by Chris McDermott and the Little mm-hmm. Heroes Foundation to run it a couple of years ago. And then obviously COVID took its toll. And he hit me up again in December last year and said, right. do you want to do it this year? And I was like, absolutely. Jumped at the opportunity to debut in your first marathon yeah. over in New York. So preparation isn't going perfectly to plan because I'm still playing footy. So exactly. can't really get the Ks in the legs. But yeah, hopefully, you know, if we hopefully go on to be successful mm. in footy this year, um, can sort of fit in a, a, yep. a few runs between now and no- November. You've obviously run a lot and we'd hope that through osmosis and genetics <laughs> that you're going to run obviously like Jess, your sister, who won the Commonwealth Gold recently. And it's a long way, 42K. I know you've run halves and all that sort of thing, but uh, she said that you will have no problem. You'll cream it. Yeah, she's setting me up to fail a bit there, I reckon. Now, uh, like I've obviously watched on with her and her career so far with absolute admiration mm. and very proud younger brother. And um, it's something that I think the trend goes, the slow twitch muscle fibres, there's always been something there. Mm. We're, uh, you know, keen cross country runners back in the day in primary school and whatnot. And yeah, it's been something that I've always thought that in the future, when the time's right, I'll be able to have a crack at. And she wants me to go on to bigger and better things. But yeah. um, no, I'll, I'll see. Hopefully I'll survive. I've, the furthest I've run is 30K to this point. So right. it's another 12 on top of that. I mean, ideally I would have had better preparation going into this, but she'll be a nice little bunny out the front for me to chase anyway. Absolutely. She told me a time that she reckons you might run. <laughs> what do you reckon it would be? Uh, I'm scared. Take a think. stab. Um, well, to give people an understanding, what, what sort of times has Jess run? When she, and she's world class. So she's like two hours 27. I right. think that's her best around yep. there. And what do you reckon um, she's put down for you? Well, in my own mind, I'd love to break three hours. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. What that's quick, is. isn't yep. it? Really, if you, it's a it's a quick run under three hours. Um, yeah, like it, my aspirations one yep. day is to go under t- sort of two forty five, right? Which is under four minute Ks. Yep. But I don't think I'll be able to do it this time. But who knows? We'll see. Well, she said if you get through your next couple of weeks of footy, okay, and yep. you don't get banged up too much, 
She said you'll run 245. Oh, wow. Here we go. <laughs> Pressure's on. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Yeah. No, That's it's, bloody um, quick. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you never want to put a time yeah. out there because you don't want to fail. But I'm pretty competitive, so maybe I'll, I'll aim for it then. Well, you're still only 31. <laughs> Just turned right? 31, 31 last week. Yeah. yeah. So you're yeah. still a young man. Yeah, hopefully. In, in, in marathoners' terms, very young. We haven't um, started yet. Exactly. Because right. that's your sort of mid late 30s, isn't it? <laughs> when you really come into your aerobic. Yeah, that's. Uh, peak. Um, well, she's proving that right. Yeah. Now. So, yeah, hopefully, we've got a few Ks in the legs over the next few years. And hopefully, this is just the first one of um, a few more to, to go. Uh, you're, running a, you're running around for Prince Alfred College Old Collegians, still yep. playing footy and going very well. I saw you obviously play the other day in the final and you look snuck over the line. Fantastic. <laughs> Are you still enjoying footy playing local footy? Yeah, loving it. I mean, you know, I've obviously played footy as a, as a job and a career mm. for a large part of my life. And, you know, towards the end of my days at Port, I was sort of ready to transition into a new career and leave footy behind and, you know, went back out to the old scholars. One of my best mates is the coach. Um, obviously, a great affiliation out there. Know a lot of the younger boys and it was just great to play footy as a bit of fun and a, in a more relaxed environment. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, amateur footy is still great quality and yeah. there's a lot of good players running around. But it was quite fresh and rejuvenating for me to go back out there and just do it for what footy is there for and it's just pure enjoyment and to get out after a hard day's work and train with the boys and have a laugh and get out on Saturdays like at the moment the best time of my week is from 2 to 4.30 oh, really? on a yeah. Saturday and I'll, I'll make a joke of it every time we run out with the whole team I'm sort of say cherish this moment boys the best day the best time of the week two yep. o'clock on a Saturday afternoon particularly out on Park 9 our home ground yeah. um, so I'm absolutely loving it and um, there's certainly other things I want to achieve in my life before the legs sort of go from underneath me, like marathons and whatnot. Mm. But for the time being, footy's, footy's great fun. Do you get a target on your head given, I mean, you're captain of the Melbourne Footy Club <laughs> and you're running around with all these guys. You've got some bloody good players in your team too that have played AFL and Sandford footy. But does anyone come after you? Have you had any issues yet in the last couple of years there? You probably get a little bit of attention at different stages. Depends how mean the, uh, the opposition coach is feeling. But... Because I feel like I'm quite fit at that level, I just think, all right, I'm just going to try to outrun you. And, they can't um, get you? Yeah. Well, well uh, no, there are some that can, absolutely. Yeah. But by the sort of end of the third, last quarter, I feel like yeah. I can sort of run over most opponents that are yeah. trying to stick on me. But, um, I mean, as you said, we've got a really good midfield and other really good players around me. So, you know, they take a lot of attention as yeah. well. But, you know, I've got good mates that try to look out for and me look after as well. Yeah. No one's tried to take the Trengove scalp or tried to rough you up or anything like that? Oh, there's no. always some. There's always good banter out in amateur yeah. footy, um, particularly from the sidelines as well. But mm. all in good nature and um, we all have a laugh and a beer afterwards about it. Can you play for another couple of years? What do you reckon? I don't know. We'll see. I mean, as as we sort of alluded to, hopefully we can go all the way this yeah. year um, after a good premiership last mm. year. And Unfortunately, throughout my career, I haven't had a hell of a lot of success. Yeah. We'll probably touch on it later. Yeah. But So I'm really making the most of being up there and around the mark every year. And there's a couple of mates that are potentially retiring from SANFL um, that I'd love right. to play with again that you never know. But uh, the body's holding up for mm. now. And as you know, you're a long time retired and yeah. you only get a certain amount of time to be able to play footy. And I keep telling my wife that. So we'll see how we go. And now your wife, Sarah, isn't is she trying to run the marathon too? She's she is. Yeah. So she was right. um, a runner growing up as well. And she's now on the path to becoming an orthopedic surgeon. So her yep. life's pretty busy and hectic, as you can imagine. And trying to get the training in for her as well is challenging, but we're both going to run our first marathon over there and trying to raise a bunch of money for the Little Heroes yeah. Foundation along the journey mm. as well. Mate, that is a massive family affair. Sister, wife, yeah. all going at it. I know, yeah. No, it should be good. Hopefully we'll get there in one yep. piece and can actually run it the way we want to. Right. I want to go back a little bit because uh, we're talking about family and I know that uh, your family growing up uh, narrow court sort of way on the land very active youth, I'd imagine. Obviously, Jess. And then your other sister, Abby. Now, she was a good rower, wasn't she? She was, yeah. And so everyone she gets, was pretty good. Yeah, no. Nah, I think she – I feel sorry for Abby because she gets lost in a lot of these conversations because, um, you know, Jess has obviously gone on to mm. achieve what she has. But Abby was a national rower as, uh, yep. as I guess, uh, in her adolescence. Mm. Um, and she was probably a little bit shorter than me, but deemed probably too small to really make it in rowing. And and she had some back issues and decided to – her passion's out on the farm and out on the land. So yeah. she ended up marrying a guy from up in Oruru, Sam Kirshner, 
and they live up there with four kids now and are happy as Larry. So childhood was amazing. I'm so grateful for the upbringing that I had, really close-knit family. Mum and dad sort of gave myself and two sisters every opportunity that we could have ever imagined. Being growing up in the country, you're sort of forced into play every sport because mm. they just need the numbers. I guess every weekend was sort of surrounded around, you know, going out to the Kobe Bowlight Footy Club and spending all day out there. And yep. in the summer, it's cricket and tennis. Mum and dad were active all the way through. And yeah, just a great community down there. And as I sort of said, I'm very grateful for the upbringing I had. Two older sisters. So there would have been Barbies. You had to get dressed up a fair bit. You were almost like their, <laughs> their little play thing, were you? Like yeah, their tutus. Like, and almost their little Barbie doll, yeah. Little um, top. So they'd dress you up quite often. Yeah, well, I was sort of in a unique <laughs> one where um, obviously two older sisters and then a couple of close cousins who were two girls as well. So right. I was little Jackie a lot of the time. And um, yeah, we just rolled with the punches. And, bit of makeup now yeah, and then. Yeah, yeah. No, a bit yeah. of everything. And some, sometimes my mates would get involved as well. So so you'd be sort of cross dressing from way back. But yeah. that's a footy thing now. Exactly. <laughs> I don't do it as much anymore. That's no, that's <laughs> probably a good idea. Um, so obviously as a youngster, you said Kobe Bay Light Footy Club. Geez, there's some decent quality. So Lockie Neal was a youngster, a couple of years younger, wasn't he, running around with you? Yeah. Um, yep. And your good mate Andrew Bradley who chalked up his 200th at Glenelg. He's a star as well. So you guys are all running around together in the country? Yeah. No, it's really funny how, you know, a couple of young guys, like Brad's and I were best mates growing up and still very close. Mm. Um, I was at his 200th the other week and uh, – what an incredible achievement that's been for him, all the injuries and whatnot that he's been through. And the Bays have been through their dark times and come yeah. throughout the other side. Uh, Lockie Neal was, he was a couple of years below me, but we played under 14 junior Colts together. And I still remember his old man, Scratcher, was um, a coach out in Kybe back in the day and would go out there on a Thursday night and just kick balls at each other all night and snap yes. a goal and whatnot. And we created a, a really close friendship through that time. And then to see him go on and achieve what he's achieved for a guy that didn't, well, sort of went unnoticed throughout the draft and was like the last pick mm. to get in and then to go and forge a career that he has and hopefully he wins another Brownlow. Was he... So he wasn't like an absolute star kid that stood out? Or could you tell early on that you knew he was going to be more than handy, obviously? He was always really good. But I think the thing that the biggest knock for him was his height, which is is sad that that can be a big knock. But we came through the draft process, whereas trying to draft a lot of athletes as opposed to genuine footballers. Yep. And he is a genuine footballer, just yeah. has um, the smarts and his uh, skills with ball in hand and cleanliness is just something mm. like, no, yeah nobody else has done in the mm. past. So I'm just so glad that a, someone like him has gone through and had the career that he's had, was still having the career he has had, yeah. and not being that old prodigy athlete from a young age. Yeah. So it was all sport as a kid? All sport, Absolutely. yeah. Every, every minute of the day I was sort of outside being active. I guess mum and dad did bring us up in a way that we, to follow our academic passions as mm. well, Jess isn't only a runner. She was a really good piano player back in the day, really good at art, quite right? intelligent. Abby the same. So we've had all these other outside passions that probably don't get spoken about because yes. sport's such a big thing in country communities. But certainly when it came to academics, I tried hard, but I was an outdoors person and just wanted to be amongst it. So she was playing piano. Did you play an instrument? <laughs> it's Come sort on. of funny. So it? Braddles and I, he'll yeah. probably hate me saying this, but we both – didn't get forced into playing the piano, but it was encouraged by both of our mums to start playing the piano. And it was really tedious for me. I don't really have a musical bo bone in my body. Mm -hmm. And then the little dangling carrot at the end was, we'll take you rock climbing in Mount Gambier right. if you get through a full year. And I got through six months and I said, bugger it, I don't even want to go rock climbing because I didn't want to play the piano. But um, Fraddles was pretty handy and Jess was very good. Is that right? Yeah. So on the night of the marathon in November when we're there, if she goes, all right, we should actually get her onto the piano. To Absolutely. To celebrate. Yeah. She's got a great memory, so she'll probably be able to just go straight back to it. Really? She's still got a piano at home, I think, that every now and again she'll get on and um, have a go. But yeah, she's uh, got more things up her yeah. sleeve than people know. Right. That's actually, that's interesting. We might have to get you on next to her doing a little duet. We'll see if those six months. <laughs> oh, God, if you want someone tone deaf sitting next to her, then absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as you said, we're growing up. You, you get through your time, go to PAC. Did you, were you ducks of the school? Is that, uh, I've always heard a little myth. Were you, uh, yeah, I got the headmaster's award or something like that. So um, Best brown nose. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Critical award. What's your headmaster's award? All rounder? I that... think so. Something like that. I don't know the exact definition, yeah. but something like that. So what was your year 12 you did pretty well? Yeah. Like, I, as I said, it was, it was a real juggling act because, mm. um, like I was never, I played representative footy throughout, like growing up, I played a bit of cricket, other sports, but I never was the, you know, high draft pick from a, as a 12 year old, I was yeah. sort of just the quiet achiever just going about my business and then it wasn't until I went into year 12 that things started going to a new level like I did a pre-season out at Sturt um, and had some good mentors out there and then sort of got selected in the under 18 state Mm. team and played a couple of trial games and played quite well so suddenly I started just jumping up from there so you know footy was in year 12 was trying to juggle school footy out at Sturt Mm. and then state footy and then also trying to you know try to get the best score possible I could in year 12 from an academic point of view. So a real juggling act. And it was probably the greatest learning for me at that age, just what balance in life really is mm. and organisation as well. Because I still wanted to go to my mate's 18th and school mm. formals and after parties because that's a big part of your year 12 and yep. schooling experience. So probably still to this day the best year of my life just because there's so many different things going on and a good time to be alive. So that's 2009. Yeah. So like you said, if it was a bit of a slow burn as you got older as a footballer, but that 09, so you're in year 12, you obviously play for SA, you're the MVP there, all Australian in the under 18s, but you start, I think the second half of the year you were playing senior footy at Sturt and everyone paid attention. And I think when you think over the last 30 years of some of the guys that came out of the, the SA NFL or the Sandfall, like you know Buckley, Pavlich, Shannon Hearn, that just came out ready-made to go, you were in that group, there's no doubt, and you'll be too modest and humble (laughs) to admit it. But Because I think in that uh, there was a prelim final playing for Sandfall against men, still at school, and you had a ripping prelim against Glenelg. And I reckon he kicked just a magnificent goal and took this great mark. I can still picture (laughs) going back with the flight, like a game-saving mark. It was a pretty amazing time for you at that age against men. Yeah, no, it's a surreal experience. And I guess I, I don't spend much time reflecting back on mm. that that time. But yeah, I was a 17-year-old just having a crack. And um, as I said, had some great people at the Sturt Footy Club yeah. sort of helping me along the way and teaching me a lot of things and got the opportunity to yeah play some finals footy at senior level against men, as you said, which was yep. a, a great experience for me to transition into the AFL. And yeah, we were probably the, I think we were the underdogs that day. Yep. Glenelg had been great all year and suddenly I was found myself on a wing and in some pretty consistent form and um, a couple of things went my way yeah. and it turned into the game that it did. And um, then next week we are playing against Centrals in a grand final as a 17-year-old. Like I was just so grateful for the opportunity to be out there. You know, the thing I reckon was interesting, a lot of people noticed, because some of those boys we talked about were like men. You know, Matty Pavlich was as big as a, <laughs> a 25-year-old bloke, sort of bloke looks like he's probably shaving at 14. Yeah. You look like a 14-year-old kid. 12. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? You, you look like yeah. a little boy, mm. but you still played very physically. And I think people people notice that. Where did that come from? Was that just growing up in the country? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I guess so. Like, I mean, when you're in the country, I think I played, you know, junior cults, for instance, under 14s. Mm. I wanted to play, so I was playing as an eight-year-old. And you're sort of mm. always used to playing – above your weight and age, I guess, which probably prepared me a bit for that. I mean, at that age, I was pretty skinny and could run, so I just tried to run away from any of the big bodies. And, um, but you were still you were physical. Yeah, oh, like I guess yeah. physical enough, got away with um, yeah. what I could get away with. And yeah, probably that country upbringing and having older sisters that you're trying to sort of keep up yep. with as well. Well, I think you look at that in 09, you go to the grand final, and I think Central was so worried about you from your performance. They put Trent Goodrum... Uh, Delta Goodrun's brother on you, yeah. um, and he and essentially he, got best on ground, he did, yeah. But <laughs> he essentially got best on ground because his role was to shut down this year twelve kid, yeah. you know. And they obviously won; they had an yeah. unbelievable side at Sample over that time. Mm. But that was amazing recognition for you that they've had to put down one of the, their best players to essentially stop a kid. <laughs> it was you a bit know? of a shock, to be honest. Like I certainly wasn't preparing for that. I was yeah. still on a bit of a high from the prelim and. I think everyone in our team were just so grateful to get to the the last day and in the grand final. And yeah, when he came out and started 
paying close attention. I'd never had that sort of physicality on me before, given I was still 17 and you have grown men trying to get yeah. after you. Um, but it was a great <laughs> learning experience and, yeah, got the reverse Norm Smith, which is um, always a great achievement. <laughs> I had the same thing. <laughs> Brett Jarmus won a Norm Smith yeah. uh, in 98, mate. Don't yeah. worry. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. I've got to ask then too, so you had this great year in 09. You obviously get through your, your school. What score do you get at school? Um, I think it was sort of 97-ish. So, um, Not bad. I just I, lost to Jess. So I was pretty filthy to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah. Would she just get a 98 or something? Uh, yeah, I think so. Jeez. See the competitiveness coming <laughs> out of there. But within a few months, you obviously get drafted number two, you know, with Scully, and there was so much talk about that. But you make your AFL debut. So within six months, you know, so you're playing against these Sturt men, then you're out on the G against the Hawks. Yeah. You, tell us about that moment when you ran out there. No, it was, uh, I sort of used the word surreal already, but it was absolutely surreal sort of pinching myself running out on the G in front of – 70 odd thousand mm. people against the Hawks round one all my dreams had sort of come true and and quickly um, yeah very quickly and quicker than I could have ever imagined you know we had a pretty young side and they were willing to give some of the young boys some opportunity mm. and got through my first grueling pre-season and you know I was learning so much and just trying to take on as much information and um, you know develop my body develop my skills and whatnot and I still distinctly remember the the first touch I ever got and it was in the first quarter at some stage the ball came my way and it all happened so quickly got a handball away and it probably went straight back to him and got whacked to the ground I was like far out this is AFL footy and then Luke Hodge came up tapped me on the ass and goes keep going young fella and I was like this is um this is real this is actually happening how big was the step up because you obviously played in a in a sample grand final so you had a reasonable level you know probably the best state league competition in the granny yeah from that game and then the next game in anger you play is yeah an AFL game um was it a massive step yeah it was um I think probably just the quickness of the game like the physicality part there's still big bodies in the SANFL particularly Mm. back then like there was still a lot of senior players who had played a lot of senior footy still playing in the SANFL but just the quickness like things just happened and skills are a lot slicker and uh, the ball movement just up and down the ground um you're having to cover a lot of ground so yeah that was probably the main difference and then just the atmosphere around like big crowds did you feel like things were just coming on obviously you worked bloody hard to get where you did but things were happening really quickly did it feel like it was all just flowing for you like the yeah. next great thing is going to come then the next great thing and this is just going to be a breeze yeah well i guess you mentioned that whole year of my year 12 into intro- introduction into afl mm. footy things did just happen no doubt i was working hard and and mm. trying hard to get to achieve those things but there weren't too many negatives along that journey Mm. um, in that little period of time. Like even my junior footy won first four years at Kybe, I won four premierships and played in another one in the senior cults in one of the same year as one of them. Moved to Adelaide, won a Sturt um, under 15s premiership, won a under 17s and reserves premiership in the same year and then went into the grand final of the league team the next year. So it was just success was everywhere. I was like, how good and how easy is this game? And then, yeah, went into the AFL, Played a debut, played most of the games in the first year, yeah. and I thought, yeah, how good is this? The reality and the dream of playing AFL footy has actually come my way, and I'm so appreciative of it, but I thought that let's just continue this. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be the greatest ever. Well, your first two years, you pretty much played most games, like 18 and 19 games for, for those years, and then you get a call to be captain yeah. of the Melbourne Footy Club. At what were you, I think you were 20 in 181 days. Yeah. The youngest captain in VFL, AFL history. Uh, and we're saying, well, it's sort of coming easy or think great things are coming quickly. What happens when you get told that? Many things go through your mind. As I've sort of alluded to, I was just taking on everything as it came and mm. um, didn't know any different. So, you know, throughout that, my second year, Dean Bailey got sacked, which was, yep. you know, really sad and one of the things that, you know, I regret throughout my career is the mm. fact that we allowed a coach like Dean Bailey to be sacked because I had the utmost respect for him, thought he was really good. And we were still going pretty well as a footy club. Like we had a bad loss, a horrible loss, to be honest, against mm. Geelong. Yeah. But sure. apart from that, we were still in finals contention and whatnot. And the club just made a snap decision yep. to get rid of him and on to the next. And then Neildy, Mark Neil came on board and then everything sort of changed and he wanted to take the club in a new direction and 
hence we did the leadership voting that year in the preseason, and um, my name came out on top. And when he yeah knocked on the door and sort at of at twenty, yeah, he said you're you're going to be captain if you're willing to do it. And I was like, didn't even know how to react to be honest, but because I'm sort of I take the approach that if that's what my teammates want, that's what the club needs, and I'm going for it, and I'm going to do it as best as I possibly can. Did you think about how like you know there's twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight year old legends <laughs> in the club? Did you think, or did you know how you were going to do it? Did you start to look and go right? I've got to maybe have potentially some hard conversations with some of these guys. Yeah, and no, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. And that was probably the most daunting thing about it all was the fact that I'm a big one for earning your respect and mm. respecting your elders before you who are more experienced and whatnot. And then, yeah, I'm going up to Brad Green and, um, you know, Colin Sylvia, Brent Maloney, those types who have played hundreds of games of AFL footy and telling them to – you know, follow me, boys. Uh, or if they sort of step out of line in any way of our team principles, then I'm the one that's has to hit them up, which was absolutely daunting at the start. But yeah. it's something that I'm grateful that I got um, exposure to that sort of environment because it's made me a a better person, and I've had to grow up very quickly and mature. And um, yeah, the the skills that I learned throughout that period has really held me in good stead now. Did the club give you the support you needed as someone that young to be able to fulfil that role? Yeah, it's sort of an interesting one. I think at the time, we just, it was a young group. We thought we'd just all do it together. I mean, mm. I reached out to a few different people and caught up with Cameron Lang a number of times because, yep. you know, he's a great leader at a great footy club. And we had some great chats about different ways to lead and whatnot. And I think, you know, the, the most difficult part of leadership is, you know, when you're under the pump. And from a performance point of view, we mm. were playing piss poor, losing mm. a lot of games of footy by high margins. And it was really tough to try to keep that weight of numbers on board and heading in the same direction. And that was the thing that I struggled with most. And I guess I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So, you know, if, if I wasn't playing well, I felt like I was letting the rest of the team down and mm. not leading the way that I should have. And I was probably went away from focusing on myself. This is the learning that I had out of it all is that yep. I was focusing on everybody else and making sure they were going mm. okay and probably neglected my own. Because this is the thing, you're not 27, 28 at this point, which yeah. would still be an issue, you know, where you're really concentrating on the team. You're 20 years of age. And we said before when you, you know, you got drafted and you're playing at Sturt, you looked 14. By this stage, you look 15. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. anyone, all I've got to do is go back and have a look at some of the pics of yeah. you when you're announced captain. And it, it's, it looks humorous because you look like such a young, young kid. Yeah. I just, and you're finding your way. You know, yeah. You had two good years of AFL footy, yet you're suddenly thrust with responsibility. I can understand that you should be really, I imagine, concentrating on your game. Yeah. How are you going to improve and develop because you're a kid? Yeah. Yet you, you have this responsibility. It seems like such a, a crazy situation. Yeah. And that's exactly right. You know, it on the head, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I mm. was absolutely still learning about myself, developing my own game, developing my off-field stuff and just maturing as a 20-year-old, yeah. as all 20-year-olds should. Yeah. And trying to find my feet in the industry, not only the AFL, but in the club. And, you know, there's so many things going on in your mind as a 20-year-old young yep. male. So I was doing all of that whilst also trying to, I guess, piggyback this, the oldest footy club in the land. To and the youngest captain in yeah, history, exactly. yeah, across yeah. any club. It was a unique experience. And, I mean... I'm never one to sort of dwell on things or look back and regret things because I think yep. I'm a true believer that everything happens for a reason. But yeah. um, if I had my time again, I probably would have approached it slightly differently or at least tried to delay that announcement for a couple of years so I could really you you would know, have, solidify yeah. myself in the yep. competition and feel confident within my own yeah. body to be able to know that I'm a, a good player out here and I deserve that role. A 31-year-old man now talking yeah. uh, amongst like the 20-year-old kid, you yeah. put that old head on those young shoulders. You you reckon at that stage you might have said, you know what, guys, I don't think I'm ready? Yeah, I think hindsight now, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely grateful everything happened the way it did because, yep. as I said, I was so honoured at the oldest footy club in the oh, land to amazing. be the captain well, you're of. You're hardly going to um, at that age turn around and go, well, you know what, guys? Yeah, uh, I right. Let's hold it, put on ice for a couple of years. Yeah, I know. I, I would hate to know how that would have been perceived. Yeah, so I'm grateful mm. and I learned so much about myself throughout that period of time. And there's no doubt that because I got the opportunity to experience that then, I'm now the person that I am yep. now. And I wouldn't be the person that I am now if I hadn't been through that. But 
no doubt. Like I, it's funny. I'll roll into training last night out at the PAC old scholars and chatting to one of the young fellas. I feel so old out there, by the way. You know, one of the twenty year olds, and I was sort of looking at him. I'm like, far out, like. That was me at that point in time. Captain of an AFL yeah. club. I know. And that's the probably the scariest part when you reflect back in those mm. sorts of moments. But those years, the two years that you captain, you still played, I think, 42 games. So you're still playing a lot of footy. You weren't... Yeah, I felt like I was, I guess, pulling my weight, so to speak. Yeah. It was just unfortunate that the team performance was really lacking at that stage. And like any sporting club, sporting team, when poor performance continues. Um, it builds up more and more pressure mm. and particularly in an industry like the AFL where, you know, media outlets and everyone's after you because you're not performing on the field and that pressure does take its toll. Were you reading the stuff? Because obviously you guys are getting a couple of big <coughs> hidings. Yeah, it's sort of hard or- not to, and especially in a the pressure cooker that Melbourne is in, mm. in regard to AFL and you try to sort of push the paper to the side and just concentrate on the things that you can control. But you know, you're walking into coffee shops and ordering a coffee and people are talking about the result on the weekend and, oh, gee, you only had this amount of touches or yeah. whatnot, and it's really hard to get away from it. So there was absolutely other outlets, and that's where st- studying was really good for me because I could just escape from footy, head away, and put my head in the mm. books and really concentrate on that because I think that balance is really critical. It's such a confronting, I think, position for anyone, let alone a young guy, to be playing that side and with the team not performing well, yet you're captain as well and you've got all these burdens. Mentally, did it take a toll? How did you deal with it? Like obviously, study, but... Yeah, I think that's the biggest learning out of everything is that I'm a pretty positive and optimistic sort of guy. I sort of think that I can put a positive slant on any situation mm. that I'm, I'm faced with. But I probably didn't realise it at the time that it was having impacts from a mental point of view. I mean, I've always been one to just put on a brave face and... Yep. keep on keeping on and you know there's moments now that I reflect back and I remember one night I, you know people talk about having sleepless nights and I've always thought like what do you mean that's a sleepless mm-hmm. night but it was literally the night before Mark Newell got sacked I couldn't couldn't sleep and I've never had that moment in my life and that's purely because I couldn't switch my brain off and I was so worried about what the next ga- day was going to bring that I literally just didn't sleep that whole night and was just up staring at the roof which was a foreign thing like maybe yep. That happens to people more regularly than I think, but um, that was such a foreign experience for me. Did you know he was going to get the bullet at that point? I didn't know if exactly, but I I mean, it was mm. pretty easy to know what was going on and there was a lot of pressure coming. And I think in my mind, without knowing it, I was building it up in my head to go in and have a chat to him because I was like, All right. something needs to change because the players, they're all offside. He was almost put out by himself on an island sort of fighting the fight by himself because most of the players had sort of moved on and Mm. went on to the next thing. So I was building courage up in myself to go and have that conversation. What were you going to say? Yeah, well, (laughs) I did Captain, did you feel you felt like you had to do it because that's your job? Absolutely, yeah. It sort of got to the point where there was the point of no return. And yeah, I was just going to go tell, say to him that literally something needs to change now because everything we've tried hasn't worked to this point in time and you're mm. losing all your players. So, mm. you know, so, unfortunately for Neil, I never got the opportunity no. to say that. Did, did, so the players are coming to you as captain or saying we need to do something? Yeah, like you, yeah. and you just get a general sense. Yeah. You know, you probably saw it in the performances on the weekend, like players going against sort of team principles and structures and whatnot. Yeah. And as soon as that happens on a consistent basis, you know that yep. you're starting to lose them. How did you find out that he was gone? Because you, you obviously you're building yourself up for this conversation. I can imagine, like you're saying, you probably run it through your head 50 times while you've looked at the ceiling. Yeah, well, I got pulled into the room and sort of said like, with um, board and whatnot to say and CEO that um, they've decided to sack the coach. And unfortunately, it was the second sacking that I'd sort of experienced of in a matter of years. And that's never something that you want to see because you feel responsible. I'm sure, the coach takes a lot of the blame, mm. um, but players have got to take responsibility. And I took that responsibility on because you know it's you're at fault for them losing their job yeah you didn't have to have the conversation though with him never had the conversation no <laughs> made um, life a bit easier didn't yeah it? exactly as i said everything happens for yeah. a reason and um i'm not sure if that conversation would have added much value at that time but yeah i was just in my mind i was always trying to think what's best for the footy club and how can we get these players playing good footy and that was what i thought needed to be done at that time. So four years in, you've pretty much played most of the games. I think you've played 79 of 88 games. 
you've seen two coaches get sacked. You've had interim coaches with Todd Viney and Neil yeah. Craig as well. Yeah. And turmoil with Bales and all that stuff. You saw. Did you feel ripped off at that stage that you'd been drafted to Melbourne? Uh, it's, it's sort of funny you say that. I mean, that's, that's the beautiful thing about the draft, right? You, there's nothing's predictable. You just it is what it is. Mm. You get selected somewhere, you go, and you make best of the opportunity. And for me, that's all I knew. So I couldn't really compare it. Like you look at a Joel Selwood or someone who's, you know, been fortunate to go into a successful club and had success his whole life. Mm. And there's no doubt you sort of reflect back and like, imagine if I got put into a club that had a great support network around it at the time and you went on and do good things and mm. have a successful run. But once again, I choose not to reflect and think about what could have been because I've made so many great friendships mm. out of my time at Melbourne and cherish those friendships and the relationships I've built that are going to you know, hold me in good stead for the rest of my life. And AFL footy professional sport is an, it's an absolute roller coaster. Mm. You go through the highs and lows. Unfortunately, I probably had more lows than highs, but at the same time, you learn so much about yourself. And um, I stand by the fact that I'm a much better and stronger person as a result. When, when I think of you and, and knowing you got drafted, I always watch things so closely after seeing you at Sturt. And Jimmy Tumpus was another one. You know, I yeah. think he went at number four, yeah. Uh, a few years later, after he'd already won the flags, the kid the year before at the Eagles. Yeah. And I sort of would watch you and looking from the outside, you see you and you see Jimmy and sort of think, if they got put in a different programs, mm. would have you had the opportunity to, you know, but like you said, you, you can't dwell on that, can you? Yeah, I know. It's one of those things that, yeah, I, I just choose not to think about it because, mm. yeah, who knows what could have happened. But yep. yeah, Tumpy is a great example as well. And, yeah. you know, I felt responsible because I was a leader at that time when he came into the club and I wanted to try to create an environment for these young guys to come in and prosper. And unfortunately, it didn't happen for Tumpy at that time. But yeah, I mean, that's the learning that I try to pass on to young athletes yeah. now and um, just to make the most of the opportunities and, yeah, don't sort of sit there and wait for things to come to you. You've got to really go out and seek it and make yourself a better individual. The dreaded navicular, and God, who knew what a navicular was <laughs> until recently, but yeah. um, this the navicular foot injury you had, that started to show its head a little bit, didn't it, during your captaincy? And was it that second year as captain you started to – but you still played the year. Yeah. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I got announced captain and, and got through my first year and started to feel this little dull pain in my foot, which um, at the time we just thought it was like a, a spur in my ankle or something mm. that was hanging around. And then unfortunately in that preseason, it got worse and worse. And we found out there was a little fracture in my navicular, which I had no idea like you what a navicular was. Mm. Had never been injured in my life that, well, injured that would allow you you know, lead me to miss more than a couple of games. Mm. And that was in preseason. So I was like, all right, I'm motivated to get back and play round one, got back and played round two mm. and played out that whole season. But something just wasn't right. I sort of- You could feel it yeah, pretty much most of the time. Yeah. And I just tried to put it at the back of my mind because I was so driven to try to get success at the footy club. I was sort of just, you know, I didn't want to sound, feel like I was a weak link and did believe that it would be fine. So I just sort of kept playing through it and you know you come out after half time and it was stiff and you just couldn't really run properly and sort of battled through to the end of the season and then I thought I'd get there and then just have some time off in the off season and yeah. it'd come good unfortunately that next preseason I came back and yeah it cracked right through and I required yeah. surgery mm. so a couple of pins into the navicular bone um had that whole season off and then um, was building up to try to get back from that and later realized that it cracked through the screws. So I had to take the screws out, put some bone marrow and a bone graft Jeez. in and go through the whole process again. So essentially you missed two year, more than two years of footy. It was about three years all back, up. Yeah. Um, yeah, which, as I said, I'd never really been properly injured yeah. for a long time. And then to go from one extreme to the other, it was tough. So how do you go from being a captain and, and you relinquished the captaincy? Yeah, yeah, like I was, I wasn't playing. I was injured and mm. everything like that. And uh, Rusey came in at that stage, and we had some conversations. And he's like, "Mate, maybe just it's time for you to concentrate on getting your body right, getting back at fully fit, and don't worry about all the captaincy stuff." And I guess the added, added responsibility from that point of view. Had you thought about that yourself before Rusey brought that? Yeah. yeah, definitely. Like I, I, th I thought it was pretty obvious at that time that that's what had to happen because. Mm you know good sitting on the sidelines as captain and I just needed to get myself right mm. from that point of view. 
what goes through your mind then? So you're sitting out for two years, and I think, I imagine one of the hardest things would be you're, you're out of the group but training because you're doing your own rehab and you, mm. you what, how do you deal with that mentally? Yeah, it's probably the toughest period of my life um, for sure, just because you grow up playing footy and you probably take for granted about being healthy. And then suddenly that's ripped away from you and, you know, you get paid and whatnot to be out there training, performing on weekends and Mm. you can't do that for a period of time. And, you know, the club was coming out of this period of having no success. Rusey came on board. You could sort of see a light at the end of the tunnel heading the right direction, but I wasn't a part of it. And Mm. so, and I'm a, you know, want to be a part of all the action. So I was trying to stay involved as much as I possibly could and took on coaching roles and whatnot to help with the young guys and still trying to be a leader because I was a leader at the club at that time. But yeah, you're in the gym in the middle of winter in Melbourne by yourself as Mm. uh, you're not having much Mm. fun. My calf had whittled away to a bone pretty much and so I had to build up my whole leg again from a strength point of view. Mm. And it was a long road, but you know, I, as I said, I learned so much about myself through that time. Like you talk mm. about resilience and you know other things, and just set little goals within myself and kept myself in a competitive mindset to make sure that you know I, my ultimate goal was to get back and play at the top level again. Yeah. Um, so I was just hell bent on motivated to make sure I got there, and and as I've sort of said a few times, but. The whole process, uh, I say it's the darkest times of my life, but it was the greatest thing that ever could have happened to me. And that sounds completely genuinely. Do you genuinely believe that? Or is that really? uh, Genuinely, because I guess, you know, we spoke about the start of this that the first couple of years of my footy career was pretty easy. I Mm. had games, I was playing at the top level, life was going pretty well. And I probably did get caught in that little footy bubble where, you're not really in reality. You're living this dream and mm. things are happening and you think, I'm going to play for 15 years, going to win a couple of flags. How Make a pack this? of coin. Exactly. And yeah. and then suddenly you get injured and everything gets ripped away from you. You're like, like I had a couple of orthopedic surgeons come to me and sort of say, mate, I can't, I don't even know how you're walking at the moment. Like your navicular bone is in is an absolute mess. And this was after the second surgery and mm. we were just, fingers and toes crossed that it would come good. But uh, so, you know, you get told that as a 22-year-old or whatever I was at the time. And I was like, far out, if footy finishes tomorrow, what am I going to do? So when I say it's the greatest thing that happened to me is because it made me look forward and think, all right, footy's done. Like, what am I doing? And I was chipping away at a commerce degree at uni, but probably Mm. just spinning my wheels a bit, cruising through. And then I thought, no, I'm actually going to take this seriously now. So head down, bum up started doing more units at in that degree yeah. and then I went outside and started meeting people within the Melbourne Footy Club directors other people within the financial industry which is what proactively I really, started to look at this stuff yeah and that's the greatest thing that I did yeah. throughout my career um, was that Geez, started, I'll tell you what you're at the right footy club then you might not have been yeah. at the right footy club when uh, well, exactly on the yeah. field but off you, field gee you talk about like <laughs> finding positives and everything I was yeah. like well this is giving me a unique opportunity to go out I was passionate about things away from footy mm. and I could pursue those aspirations and meet new people doing wonderful things around the mm. world. And that's where I really discovered my passion for finance and mm. equities in particular. And it's got me to where I am now. And because I was able to understand that younger, well, at a younger age earlier on in my career, mm. I could really prepare myself for what that career is going to look like once footy finishes because you know, no matter how good your footy career is, that day comes when the list manager says you've either got to hang them up or you're done yep. and you've got to be prepared for that moment. I want to get back to where, because I think given where you are now and what you're doing, helping other players set themselves up, you know, with uh, with Lanyon, the yep. company you're working with, is you're probably the poster kid for being able to do that to people, you know, in an empathetic way. But there was one point where you were convinced you were going to be a Richmond footballer, wasn't there? You're absolutely we're done. It was all going to be uh, go ahead. Yeah. You talk about sort of sliding doors moments. It was the off season. I just, so I'd had surgery once yep. and was coming back rehabbing and mm. it was the off, yeah, off season. I was yep. heading into a new year thinking I'm going to be ready to go for the days this year. And then I get a phone call from the footy manager at that time sort of saying, mate, we've just got off the phone with Dimmer Hardwick. He's pretty keen to have a chat and I think you should entertain that conversation. <laughs> and I was like, far out. Like, Given my heart and soul to this place, and suddenly you're told to go 
have a conversation with another club because we think we might trade you. This is the team that made you captain at 20. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, at the at the at that moment, I was, took a bit of offence to it. But yeah. at the same time, I'm like, this is the industry, right? It's yeah. as much as love loyalty, it is a bit of a meat market. And I understand it because it's the clubs making the best decision for them at any given point in time. That's a mature approach, yeah. what you're <laughs> saying there. And you're still a young man when that happens. But surely the process isn't that easy to go, you know what? Bloody hell, you don't want me. Okay, so the industry's like this. Yeah. But in between that thought process, yeah, well, it must be like stuff you. Yeah, and it gets even more awkward because you know I was, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. So I went the next morning, went to Punt Road, and Dimmer was there with a few other coaches, and they rolled out the red carpet. You know, Koch and all the guys were mm. there. And they sort of, you know, PowerPoint presentation up there and bang, your name goes straight in the guts with oh. Koch and Martin and whatnot. <laughs> like, you're going to be a big part of our future. Yep. And this is just before they went through all of their success. Yeah. So then I went away that weekend with my girlfriend at the time. I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I've, I've only ever thought that I'm going to play for the D's. Mm. And now suddenly I've been throwing this curveball. So I had the weekend to think about it. So we drove down to the southeast, actually, and... um met mum and dad, they mm. drove down from Adelaide and sisters and whatnot and I told them everything that was happening and I was driving back to Melbourne that day and I was like, oh, I'm a Richmond player, like it's, it's done. You would have just and had the old Tigerland song ticket. Yeah, it's a exactly. good song. It is a good song. No, I don't mind Tigers. Um, and Unless, of course, you're on a bus in a Crows camp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so I got back to Melbourne and the last thing I had to do was tick off the medical. So, yep. you know, I was coming back from – my stressy and surgery in the navicular. So I went back to Punt Road, sat down with the doctor, the physios, and I started hopping on my left foot. And I was like, right. something doesn't feel right. But I was like, this is all part of the process. You know, it's just about getting back to running again. Yeah. Anyway, they had more scans and um, I was out on the golf course the next day with a couple of mates and got a call from the Melbourne doctor. He goes, mate, you're going to have to come in. And I was like, what the hell is happening here? I was thinking I'm... Out of sign with Richmond, and now the Melbourne club doctor's yeah. calling. He goes, oh, We found some more cracks in the navicular bone. It's cracked through the screws. So you're probably going to have to go in for more surgery. So, had, the, had Richmond seen these scans? <clears throat> yeah, they were the one that. Um, oh, they got the scans. And they passed them on to the Melbourne doctor right. to say, You guys uh, have missed something here. Yeah. So, yeah, everything fell apart. I was like, Well, the Richmond deal was off because I was injured. And they were like, yeah. Look, maybe if you can get back from the next surgery, we'll entertain the yeah. idea again. So you talk about being filthy yeah. with the club because they've pushed <laughs> you away and then they're having a cuddle and bring you back in again. So And you were still contracted I was, for a yeah. while? Yeah, you I was contracted for another two years, I think. So Right. So you're back to their asset and they're going, right, how do we protect this? Exactly, yeah. So it's 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 unique. You learn a lot. Um but mm. yeah, I can't I mean I don't hold any grudges. I, I love the D's and I'm still a big D supporter and yep. that's footy right. So in those seven, the four years after you had those four great years, captain and everything like that, you played something like seven games. Yeah. It, obviously, the navicular caused all sorts of problems, but even towards the end when you were playing really good footy and I think you won the, the Casey, the twos, B and F, was the foot giving you grief then or were you pretty much yeah, got over that? Yeah, so it's when you anyone that misses four years of any form of sport yeah. and building, as I said, my leg had sort of dwindled away to nothing. Mm. So I had to build it right back up and got back to playing consistent footy. And my goal was to play AFL again. Yep. I ticked that box and now I'm yep. like, all right, now I'm going to make myself an integral part of this footy team. And yeah, I was playing consistent footy in the VFL. And I guess like I probably did lose a little bit of that sort of top end speed and, mm. um, that ability to move the way that I used to move and like jumping and stuff like that. Like my left foot was pretty critical to yep. <clears throat> everything that I used to do, but I was like determined just to keep grinding through and finding ways to improve and get through those little hurdles. Yep. And yeah, I was playing consistent footy in the VFL and then it, the club got to a point in time where, you know, the likes of Petraka, Brayshaw, Clayton Oliver were all starting to come through mm. and really good mates of those guys and I was trying to help them in the VFL to make them really good AFL players. To take and your spot. They, that's what eventually happened. So, which I'm grateful for. Like I, I get a lot of pride sitting back and watching those guys play the way they do to think that I potentially played a, a role, maybe mm. not a significant role in their mm. careers. Um, you know, Christian Petrak is a great example. He did his knee in his first year. 
So I had my foot, he did his knee. We were best buds in rehab together, swimming, riding together. And we did that for a whole year. And I cherish those moments because I feel like I would have taught him a lot of things about yeah. just preparation and sort of organization, diligence and, and whatnot. And hopefully that sort of helped him in his journey. Yeah. So when they win the flag, obviously, and you're over in Perth watching, I'm sure you took some joy out of it. Do you have that little moment to wonder what if? Cause yeah. You- yeah. A lot of what if moments. I mean, one of my best mates is big Maxi Gorn. Mm. So to see him come on and leaps and bounds in the way that he has, like we got drafted together and um, he was everything a captain shouldn't be at the time when he was <laughs> drafted. Um, yeah. Well, there's that famous story of him having a dart in the yeah, way of training, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. That you got and caught that's out absolutely with? true. Every bit yeah. of it. And he'll admit it now. Uh, yeah. So to see him go on and become the, the player and the person mm. that he is today is mm. um, amazing. So, you know, he, some of them I'm close with and he got to see that success, which I was so you know, so motivated to see. And sure, I didn't get to um, feel it personally and I don't have a medallion around my mm. neck, but as I sort of said, I live vicariously through a few of those younger guys that I feel like I might have impacted along the journey. And, you know, Gorney's a very kind guy and he always, you know, talks to me and reflects back to the things that I taught him. I certainly didn't teach him how to win a hit out or <laughs> take a mark, but you do feel a part of it some yeah. way, even yeah. though you weren't the one that got yeah. the ultimate success. You sound way, way, way too mature to <laughs> 31, Jack, but given you've been through so much, it's, it is remarkable. So you were able to enjoy that win? Yeah, absolutely. There was no, yeah. no resentment, no anger? No, couldn't have been more proud. And one of the things actually, so, and this just sums up another person mm. that I became really close with over that time, Paul Ruse. So the night of that grand final, boys won, they were all heading out to the city and my wife and I were like, no, I was like, it's their day. They've had the success. I've said good day to Gorney and a few of the boys, yep. congratulated them, but I didn't want to rain on their parade. So mm. we happily walked back to the hotel and um, enjoyed the night together. And Rosie called me and he said, mate, you know, you should be really proud. He wasn't a part of it either. Like he obviously built the club to what yep. it was. Yep. He didn't. He wasn't there on the day as coach or anything like that, but he sort of gave me a call and said, you're just as big a part of this mm. as anyone at the footy club. And they're the moments that you're like far out, like you do, you do feel appreciated. Yeah. Mm. That's fantastic, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Probably for him too, though, like you, because he, he, he did so much. Yeah. Probably just and having that little moment where he's thinking, well, you know, I could have quite I, been there. Exactly. But I think he takes a lot of joy out of seeing mm. Goody go and get the success he did because he's the one that pulled Goody mm. in and, you know, made him the, the next coach after him. And yeah. he's – a massive part of why the club's gone to where it has. Ruse yeah. is that for that matter because he changed the culture and just changed the whole um, way that we approached footy and life in general. And I'm sure every one of the boys that were involved at the footy club when he was there would would uh, yeah. repeat what I've said. It's a remarkable turnaround for the footy club because you think of those times early when you started Geez, there must have been some really, really dark times. Yeah. I mean, I think – that initial period, literally everything that could go wrong did go wrong. I mean, we were as now as captain. Jim Steins passed away, mm. obviously a huge part of the footy club. Um, Liam Jara went through some sort of issues, mm. which we had to deal with as a playing group, and we weren't getting the success. And obviously, there's a proud club that hasn't had success for so many years, mm. and you're feeling that pressure as every year ticks by. So to see it turn around from what's that, probably 2013, 2014, yep. into winning a premiership last year. Mm. The saddest thing about it all is the fact that none of the Melbourne supporters could actually get there because it was yeah. in Perth. So yeah. I was grateful that I was one that could actually get there and see yeah. it. But, gee, if the boys make the grand final this year, the G yeah. will be absolutely pumping. It was a great spectacle in Perth, though. Geez, they did yeah. an outstanding job. That was better than Brisbane the year before, I yeah. you know, as a, as a setting. No, they did like everything. And I guess we were so used to this COVID world where you couldn't, mm. you know, shake people's hands or give each other a high yep. five. And suddenly yep. we're back in Perth in the stadium, like getting beers poured on you from yeah. the neighbor yeah, next door. Yeah, like, yeah, it was yeah, exactly. great. You felt yeah. like you're back to normal life. Obviously, family is such a huge part of you guys and your mum and dad, Colin, Deb, and yep. your sisters that you talked about. Given the adversity you've all been through, 
Having to um, cancel and rebook your wedding three times would have been water off a duck's back, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, it was easy. I, I would have done another five times after everything we've been through. Yeah, no, that was an interesting time. I mean, COVID threw up so many different situations and scenarios, but Sarah and I did get married at the mm. end of last year, which, um, yeah, greatest day of my life and great to have the, um, you know, mum and dad who have been such a great support network yeah. for our whole family over the years and, to see them with a big smile on their face on that day as well mm. was um, was a great moment. So that was when we were meant to get married. What was the original time? So I literally proposed the day before COVID hit. Really, I think uh, my right. timing was perfect. We went yeah. to the feathers, had a few beers, and it was all good. And then literally the next day, it was that was it. Shut. So we were meant to get married at the start of 2021, I think. Yep. Then it sort of got pushed back, back, and then I thought we we're going to have to delay it again because then that the second wave came and. Yep. Suddenly, going into Christmas, we're like, far out, are we going to get this away? But um, we managed to and still happily married. Were there, <laughs> were, there still, um, were there still bans on numbers of people at weddings at that point? So there, there, there was culling? a few restrictions, but we were lucky. It was literally the next week after our wedding when it went to oh, shit again. Right. Um, literally, remember January, what was it, 2021, mm. where it all, no, sorry, started this year. Yep. It all took off again and yeah. um, restrictions came back yep. to a degree. So we got it away the way that we wanted, which yep. is really good. As on Sarah's family have a property over on the Mornington Peninsula. So we had oh, nice. you know, a hundred odd people out there and yeah, a unique time yeah. where all your best friends are in the one spot. Given that you've been through so much with your roller coasters and that sort of thing, I must, I can see now here, your perception of the world and your perception of adversity and all that sort of thing. You just take everything in your stride now. Yeah. It's sort of funny. I think my wife gets really pissed off at me because nothing really phases me anymore. Like I feel yeah. like I've been through and experienced a lot of different things. And don't get me wrong. Like I've, I'm absolutely fortunate to live the life that I mm. have. I've had so many great opportunities and experiences come mm. my way. And talk about adversity. It's nothing compared to some people out there in the world. But yeah, literally everything that happens to me, I, like, Sarah sometimes just has a crap day and she gets home from work and thinks like she just wants to be miserable. But yep. I'm always like, nah, look, like this happened and then there's a positive there. And she's like, just let me be miserable for a second. Well, here. misery so, loves company. Yeah. You need to feel, and sometimes you, you're not there to provide the solution, Jack. Nah, you know that, eh? You're I just, know, yeah. I've, I've, I'm getting better, still improving, yep. but I hate dwelling on things. Like I remember yeah. I used to, I'd get pissed off for about five minutes and I'm like, nah, it's time. We're back yeah. on. Like, from when you were next? younger? Yeah. Like I was always just, Looking forward, all right, there's got to be something else and there's no point dwelling on something that went wrong. Like, what's the learning? I want a solution. I'm on to the next thing. And that's just the way I'm wired, whether it's good or bad, um, I'm not sure. That's mum and dad. Yeah, definitely. Dad's like possibly one of the most positive people that I've ever met. Like he's, you know, been through his ups, ups and downs as yeah. well, but he's always been like – He's never looked back as to what's happened prior. He's like, all right, yeah, that's happened for a reason. What's next? Let's have a crack at it. I, can, I know your dad had a, a health issue with your cancer. So yeah. there's you and him. You're probably the two most positive people <laughs> to help navigate your dad through such a big challenge. Yeah, no, I think, you know, he doesn't, he probably didn't need the help out of anyone that needs help. Like he took it all in his stride. Mm. And yeah, as you said, it was a tough time for the family because he's, being diagnosed with cancer and a pretty serious cancer at the time. Um, and we'd never had any significant adversity yeah. anyway, like life-changing yeah. adversity in our family. So mm. to be dealt that news was pretty confronting at the time. And, you know, a lot of things go through your mind at, at that particular point in anyone's life. Mm. And, you know, suddenly I'm thinking far out, what if dad's not here tomorrow? Mm. And, you know, all these things go through your head, but dad's like, nah, this is part of the process. Like I've, these are the cards I've been dealt. I'm going to attack it this way. And to see him go through what he did and come out the other side, like you wouldn't even know that he's been through a pretty tough time with mm. cancer and mm. a full dose of heavy chemo mm. that threw him around for 12 months. But he's just on with the job and kept working and just wanted to keep attacking life, keep riding his bike. And, um, you know, I, I sit back and our whole, whole family does, so proud of what he's been able to do. It's got to say something about mindset. Yeah. It has to, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like a physiological issue that it is, but given having that positivity and the optimism, it, it, I don't understand it, but yeah. it's got to have some benefit physiologically on your body and recovery and all that. Oh, definitely. Big believer in that. Mindset 
plays a huge role in anything that happens in mm. your life. And yeah, using him as an example, he mm. like watching him go through chemo was one of the hardest things that I've ever seen. Like he had the surgery, had the tumor removed. They were pretty happy with it. They got everything, but because it was such a weird and fast growing tumor, they were worried that it'd spread everywhere. And where, where was it initially? So it was in his groin and they yeah. thought it was cause he loves riding. He's an active yeah. man. They thought it was like a, an injury from yeah. cycling. Um, and then, yeah, it was a golf ball that turned into an avocado by the time he sort of got it out. So Jeez. that all happened. And then they were like, because it's a weird and severe sort of cancer, they were worried mm. that it had spread. So they hit him with everything. And I remember the first day he went in for chemo, he went home and he couldn't move for the next 24, yeah. 48 hours. And dad is never a guy to sit still. He's always out in the garden doing stuff, mm. being active, positive. And watching him in bed, unable to move was... Yeah, easily one of the worst experiences that I've ever seen to see him in pain and yep. you can't do anything about it. So, yep. but that mindset of his just to be like, no, nah, this is part of the process, mm. on to the next one and just mm. tick off the weeks, set little goals. You know, it was, it was fortunate that the hospital that he was at was right near my work. So I'd go have lunch with him most days and just be around him to try to jeer him on. Not that he, he was probably providing me more support than I was um, providing mm. him, but yeah, as I said, he's been incredible. It sounds like you, your mum and dad were hardwired to be able to, just the way things were, the way you've been brought up to deal with adversity, given he's able to you know, yeah. work through that. You've been through your times. It probably helps Jess when she's at 34K and her body feels like it's about to blow yeah. up and she's got two Africans in the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, you go, yeah. None of that stuff is any problem compared to perhaps what you've seen you know, dad go through and all that, that you can take it in your stride. Yeah, definitely. I think you use that sort of experience from your close ones to yeah. help you navigate through different challenges that you're going through. Yeah. And I think Jess might have even said this after her race, but Abby, the middle sister, she had her fourth child just before the, the Commonwealth Games. And Jess said that at the 30K mark when it was starting to hurt and she could hear the Africans on her shoulder and um, she wanted to keep grinding forward. She used Abby's, like she imagined her mind like Abby giving birth and how hard <laughs> that must have been. So <laughs> this is nothing in comparison. Wow. So using little motivations yeah. like that yep. certainly helps. But yeah, I'm very grateful that I've got a rock solid family. I haven't given mum much credit here, but yeah. you know she's exactly the same and yep. she'd go in a bat for you in any situation mm. that you're in. And um, yeah, I'm Extremely grateful. Well, I saw your mum on the weekend standing on the sidelines because it was <laughs> worth three or four points in the end you won by, yeah. and uh, I could see her egging you on to make sure that you guys got over the line. Yeah, she reckons that between the three kids, we're killing her heart rate and um, <laughs> blood pressure uh, every week, and I certainly did that on the weekend with the footy result. <laughs> um, one thing that you have been able to do, and I think, like you said, because what you call the, the best thing that could have happened to you was with that adversity with your injuries was look to a different life and a different future yeah and now you're providing we touched on lanyon before now what's your title you're an analyst uh yeah so equities wear, analyst yeah is that it? wear a few different hats i guess an analyst also a sort of portfolio mm. manager yeah so a bit of background about lanyon uh, dave prescott founded lanyon yep. um, 12 years ago we're the only sort of equities fund manager here in south australia and a lot of people get confused by using you know terms that they've mm. never heard, but essentially mm. what we do is buy companies on the stock market, yep. put them in a portfolio and allow investors to get exposure mm. to that portfolio of stocks. Now you've specifically got a whole, uh, I suppose, portfolio you've created for athletes. Yeah. So I guess I was fortunate enough to meet Dave when I moved back yep. to play at Port Adelaide for a couple of years and I'd finished my degree. You get a day off while you're a footballer during mm. the week. Some play golf, some play PlayStation. And I was pretty keen to figure out what I wanted to do next. And mm. Dave said, look, come and sit on my shoulder, learn what we do at Lanyon, and you know, you never know what will happen. So every day off for those two years, I put my slacks and shirt on and cruised in the office. And yeah. it was the greatest thing I could have done because I learned so much about the industry. And yeah, it got to a point where at the end of my port career, I could have tried to squeeze a lemon out of my footy career for a bit longer, but I was yep. like, I'm so ready to transition and was yeah. so excited about my next career yep. that we played in the granny for the Maggies against the Bays. And yep. the next week I was putting the shirt on and cruising in full time at Lanyon. And so, yeah, I set up this fund with Dave with the idea that from my past experience, athletes were, you know, they'd go and buy property or do other things yep. with their money and get no exposure to 
the share market yep. or equity, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah. And I was seeing so many examples of teammates, coaches, other athletes getting to the end of their careers yeah. and having nothing to show from a, from a financial point of view. And I hated to see that. And, you know, that led to financial stress or, you know, mental health issues and whatnot. So I was like, how about I try to create a vehicle where players can tip some money in and hopefully build up a bit of a nest egg for the future mm -hmm. and capitalize on them earning good money at a young age. So that was all the the concept in my mind. And I was actually able to bring that to reality in September 2019. So we just celebrated our three-year birthday for the Langan Elite Athlete Fund, you know, at the end of last month. And, you know, to, it's been really pleasing and a, a really rewarding experience mm. to know that you're sort of helping out athletes prepare for the future and put some money away. And we've managed to luckily double yeah. their money in three years. So really, it's, yeah, it's really exciting. And there's <laughs> over the hardest parts to limit the expectation now because yes. they're pretty handy returns. But, mm. um, you know, in any given year, we're just trying to get consistent sort of yeah. 10 to 15% returns. And hopefully over a long period of time, that'll set themselves up well. If you're talking to, let's go away from the finance for a moment, you're talking about life yeah. and you're talking to an 18, 19 year old, whether it's a football boy, girl, whatever. Yeah. Given the journey you've been on, and it's still got a long, long way to go, but given the journey you've been on, what's your advice to someone 16, 17, 18, 19? Yeah. What have you learnt would be like the, the Jack Trengove life lesson? Yeah, it's probably going to be something boring, to be honest. Like I th I'm a big believer in just having good life balance. I think too often you see people put all their eggs in the one basket. Like I'd, if there's a young, I speak to many young footballers who are, you know, want to, learn something and say like how'd you go in the draft mm. process like how should i be thinking about this and whatnot um for them i'm like absolutely go for it but enjoy life while you're doing it and make sure you're you're seeking out other passions and making sure you're still pursuing them as well because yes footy or any particular mm. chosen job or industry that you go into that is a portion of your life but there's a whole nother yeah. life out there and it's people get caught in these little bubbles and just concentrating and focusing on the one thing. And I think that's when people fall into trouble because they get burnt out and they're not appreciating everything that's going on around mm. them. So that's probably a big part, just life balance. And then also just treating people well. It's a simple thing, but it's amazing how many times, you know, the world comes around full circle and you never know who you're talking to or who that person knows. And just taking the time to ask them how they're going, yep. learn a bit about what they're doing. And it's amazing how often that comes around to benefit you. And mm. you don't do it with that intention, but no. yeah, just being a kind person and a conscientious person with others around you. Good life lessons. The Jack Trengove <laughs> life lessons are fantastic. Uh, I don't know. It's it's not groundbreaking stuff, but- um, It's important stuff. If people do it well, it's, it's amazing how good yep. your life can be. Well, mate, thank you so much for sharing everything, being so open. It's been an amazing journey that you've travelled so far, and there's still plenty to go, including 42.195 <laughs> kilometres through remind me. New York. And I look forward to that night in a couple of months when we get to sit there in New York in a bar and watch you and Jess uh, twinkle the ivories and <laughs> see yeah. what sort of magic you can play on the piano. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm still standing at that stage, <laughs> um, one beer might be enough for me that night. <laughs> well, the uh, the medal around your neck, I reckon, might have 245 engraved on it, mate. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Hopefully. Have you got a time in mind that you're going to do? Or? Just just need to get to the end. Just mate. get there. Just yeah, need, yeah. need to get to the end. I've done a couple of them and just know, well, I just want to get through and uh, the body's too old to try and go too quick. Yeah. I'd love one day to be able to run, you know, around three hours, but I'm never yeah. going to be able to do it. I think 3.30 is about the best I can do. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. But – um. That's it ain't 2.45. Yeah, well, we're not there yet. Um, <laughs> maybe one day. We'll see yeah. how we go. <laughs> oh, good on you. Hey, thanks so much for joining us, mate, and good luck for the finals too. Yeah, no, thank you very much, and thanks for having me. I think it's a great sort of thing you're doing here, getting out and talking to people and um, that vulnerability thing mm. with not only athletes but people in general is really important, and the more people talk, the better off you'll be, and, yeah, I think it's great what you're doing. Good on you, mate. Thank you so much for being here. Cheers, Soda. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. Now, if you love what you just heard, please subscribe to the Soda Room podcast. You could write a review. Uh, you can watch the show on YouTube and share it with your buddies. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, drop us a line, info at thesodaroom.com. Catch you soon. Soda Room.